Hello, everybody. I'm Odin. Thanks for coming to my talk. You're actually at the wrong talk. Hand upstairs is way better. Because I'm just going to talk to you about ice cream. See, if, if you're an ice cream place and you have a lot of people that want a lot of different flavors of ice cream, then the strategy is you take like four or five base flavors of ice cream and then like sprinkles and cookie dough and chocolate and all sorts of stuff. And then you mix it all together. And you call it a mix it. And apparently there was an ice cream place back before I was born that did this. <clears throat> and uh, since programmers are not that good at naming things, some guys were there having ice cream and they stole the term, right? So in software, mix in is a bunch of software components that you can mix together to sort of collaboratively, through composition, uh, fulfill some task, right? The other reason you're at the wrong talk is I'm a bare metal engineer, and I'm going to talk to you about microcontrollers, right? This is actually the domain that I work in and where I sort of develop this need for some, some compositional functionality where I can take a bunch of different small components, compose them together, and get efficient code, right? <clears throat> and I've been sort of at this problem for a while, you know, uh, writing, writing bare metal drivers, uh, you know, on these tiny chips, we have serial ports, we have uh, analog digital converters and all sorts of stuff, and they aren't abstracted very well. <clears throat> so there's a bunch of different ways to write bare metal drivers. We could do it in assembler. That's what I did for a bunch of years. Problem is, I don't know if you have infinite discipline. I certainly don't. I screw stuff up, and then it's really hard to find an assembler. I mean, when's the last time you trashed a stack frame in a higher level language? You do it all the time in assembler. So that didn't really work out so well. You could do it in C with macros, and this is how most of the industry does it. Um, and the reasoning is, well, C++ is too complicated, for one, but macros are simple. Um, <clears throat> and C++ is not as efficient, right? Which I would contend. The, the chip vendors usually provide drivers. And if you write one well in modern C++, you can usually beat them by several x on efficiency, both flash footprint, sometimes even RAM footprint, execution time, because you can't be very generic in C. And we'll see this a bit later. You can do it by hand in C++. That doesn't scale very well, because there's like 10,000 different drivers you could write, and they're all pretty much the same. You could do it through aggregation. You have a bunch of composable pieces and then write all the glue code yourself. But glue code ends up being somewhere close to the same amount of code you would have written anyway. That doesn't work so well. You could do it with inheritance virtual functions. You know, uh, Qt is actually pretty good at sort of generic composition of widgets. And this is all built on inheritance and virtual functions. This does work. You can generically program that way. It's just not very efficient. Um, this is also how the, uh, the embed project from ARM works. Um, they have pretty good abstractions for a bunch of microcontrollers. They're just not efficient at all, right? I mean, there's uh, um, some Dutch students that did a comparison recently and found that writing your own assembler is something like 300x faster. And in this domain, 300x is a lot, right? We're not, we're not writing cell phone apps or something. We need performance. So that doesn't work so well. And this is, this is the, what I spent, or wasted, way too much time on. Uh, you can do it with inheritance and curiously Turing template pattern, as sort of described in Andre's book. This is called policy-based class design. And the idea is you take a bunch of policies, and you have like a combiner class, 
And then you can compose all these policies together and you get some uh, generic flexible functionality, at least in theory. <clears throat> the problem is nobody understands that code anymore, including myself, because it's just a bunch of template spaghetti. So that obviously doesn't scale very well. Sort of at work and on my free time and in general, I want to solve this problem. I mean, I want, I want to open up a microcontroller project with generic code and start programming the same way I do it on other systems. Right? I mean, Sean Parent makes a very good point in his Google Tech Talk from like 10 years ago. Procedurally written programs hit a limit at some point where the more, the more effort you put into it, the more you're just fixing your bugs and patching around in circles, right? And he's making that point about Photoshop, which is a code base of like 10 million lines, whereas on, on a lot of these bare metal systems, like 10 lines of code, oh, you're already hitting that limit. <laughs> So I want to change that, right? So, so I'm going to tell you how it works now. Uh, I haven't solved it all, but that's kind of the point of this talk is to kind of explore this, this, uh, this space, right? We're going to look at a bunch of gory implementation details. Or, uh... By the way, who's noticed that this picture has been in every talk I've ever given? <clears throat> Two guys, three guys, nice. It's been hidden sometimes, but. So I'm gonna talk about sort of another twist on the curiously occurring template pattern, um, which I originally called agent-based class design because programmers are bad at naming things. And a bunch of people told me, hey, that's mixed sense. So it's mixed sense. Um, in contrast to policy-based class design, uh, we actually have two kinds of mixed sense. We have interface mixed sense and we have implementation mixed sense. Right? And the idea is the outside world can see the interface mixins, my bells and whistles here. And when they call their member functions, then those member functions can be in implemented in terms of the implementation mixins. If I want to compose this, then I have a factory function. I just call compose, and it all magically self assembles. The glue code just writes itself, right? I can pass sort of interface mix-ins in, in this uh, um, bariatic alias. They can't have state. Implementation mix-ins can have state. I can even initialize them. If there's something that needs to go into them before they go into the composition. And what gets spit out the other end is an object that has the public interface of all of the interface mixins. And the user doesn't need to know how it's implemented under the hood. I can also have a lot more flexibility than I might have at, uh, in policy-based class design because I can just randomly add optional stuff, right? I mean, maybe guts or more guts might need an allocator, and they're using the default one unless I provide them an allocator, and suddenly all the glue code changes, right? The magic of TMP. Um, but before we get into sort of the, the uh, gory details, I wanted to go over sort of the terminology that I've come up with here so that we know what, what I'm talking about in any given part of the talk. The composition refers to the whole thing, right? I have a composition of mix-ins. It's what the compose function returns. And then the interface mixins, those are these guys. They add to the public interface. The requirement on an interface mixin, you know, if you write your own, is that you take one template parameter and derive from it. Otherwise, all of your public stuff gets added to the public interface. It's just a normal class. You just need to publicly derive from your template parameter. And I even highlighted that if I had remembered my slides. <laughs> then we have the implementation mixins. The requirement on implementation mixin is nothing. 
Any class can be an implementation mix-in. If we don't really have any special requirements on the implementation, and we have minimal requirements on the interface, there must still be some way for them to find each other. The word for this is abilities. So if I'm an interface mix-in, and for my implementation I need some implementation mix-in, it would be kind of stupid if I needed to know its type, right? That wouldn't be generic. I wouldn't be able to swap that out for any other type. So the interface mixins find the implementation mixins by ability, right? I have something that has the allocator ability, right? And implementation mixins can rely on other implementation mixins also through abilities, right? So if, so if I'm a guts class and I might need an allocator, well, I'm going to check if one exists, and if yes, then I'm going to use it, and if not, I'm going to have some fallback, right? And abilities like most things in metaprogramming are just tags, as in an empty struct, or we just use its type as a tag to mean something. So if I'm implementing my interface mixin and I need to find some implementation mixins by ability, then I can just call for each, anything that's ringable, call its ring member function, right? <clears throat> We'll see how this works later in the talk, but the takeaway here is this, is this is actually relatively simple. Like a user that doesn't have a whole lot of metaprogramming knowledge could write this, right? You know, magic incantation at the top derived from your template parameter, and then this for each function, yeah, anything that's ringable, pass it this lambda. Lambda gets the, uh, you know, this parameter A is, is the actual implementation mix-in, it's passed into me, and then I can manipulate it, right? But how does the metaprogramming know which ability, you know, which, which implementation mix-in has which abilities, right? Well, there's this factory function called make mix-in. It's a factory meta function, right? So it's an alias. I say, here's an implementation mix-in, in this case, the guts impl and a bunch of abilities, as many as I want. So implicitly, interface mixins or implementation mixins also require things to also be in the composition. They have requirements, right? So if, so if I don't have a fallback, I need there to be an allocator in there, right? I need memory. You must provide an allocator. The cool thing is we don't actually have to express these, right? They're implicitly expressed. I called for each unringable. That means zero to n, right? If I needed exactly one, I could have called execute. And if there were two that were found, compilation error. None of them in there, compilation error, right? So the, so the requirements are essentially implied just by me using other things, right? So it's, so it's, there's nothing that can get out of sync. It kind of comes naturally. I just have to make sure that I uh, name all my functions right. And uh, you know, but but what if I what if I have some really weird requirement? Like I need there to be 15 of this thing, and none of them ha can have this other ability or something. Right? I mean, USB endpoints are an example. I can just pass an arbitrary meta function. If you were at my other talk, you'll understand these are kind of meta closures. Um, I can just pass one in and do custom filtering, and it'll just spit out whatever matches that filter. I can, I can put requirements in there and completely customize how I find and use mixins if I need to. For most cases, there will be a generic function for whatever n to n. Um, or x to y number of things that you're acquiring. So where is the metaprogramming, right? We haven't really seen any sort of gory, screamy details yet. <laughs> well, they're in the, the composition has to hold everything together, right? And I'm not really going to go into sort of the implementation of this make base function. We're just going to describe sort of how it works on a high level. There's some magic class called access. And access derives from some magic class from prote called protect. 
protectedly, right? So I have uh, protect has a has a base class called access, which it uh, which is protected when it derives from it, right? And we're going to pass that whole type, you know, this type down at the bottom. We're going to pass it to the first interface mixin. And remember, interface mixins take a template parameter and derive from it. So we're building up a chain, right? So the interface derives from protect, derives from access, next interface, gets that passed to it, derives from it. We're building this whole chain from very top level all the way down to this magic class called access. And the thing here is, we also passed our top level type to access, so it knows what type the top of this chain is, right? So if it knows the type of its, the derived class of its derived class of the derived class of the derived class, it's legal to cast its this pointer to the this pointer of that derived class, right? If I have a pointer to base, and I know that base is actually a derived, I'm allowed to upcast it, right? And since I put the type of the derived class in the template parameter of the deepest base class, then it can just cast itself up. And so anybody in this chain can access anybody in this chain without virtual functions, without any uh, runtime magic, right? So if we want access to be able to uh, access the uh, private data members of composition, and it also has to be a friend, right? So now people from the outside can't get in. I mean, they can't, they can't cast the composition all the way down to an access because it's through the protected base, right? Through that protect function, that's the only reason it's there. And they can't get at the private data members of, of the composition, but from within, we can't, right? So and this for each function is just a free function, it's actually, when you have this many templates kind of going around, it's actually hard to find some syntax where you don't need a disambiguator. <laughs> so for each is actually a free function found through ADL. <laughs> but that means I don't need any angle brackets or any disambiguators, and I'm just passing it my this pointer. And it's casting that this pointer to an access and then calling ability, and in its implementation, it can basically access everything inside. The question is, have I broken encapsulation? Because if for each is a free function, anyone can call that, and anyone can have a this pointer of my composition or any of the interfaces, because the interfaces derive publicly from the composition. The trick here is, I'm casting this to the access, I'm constraining the template parameter input, so I'm forcing a conversion from derived to base at the call site. And if at the call site, you're allowed to cast to a protected base, this will work. As in, if you are in this chain somewhere, you'll be allowed to cast to your base, if you're a member function, right? If you're not in this chain, you will not be allowed to cast to that protected base. So there still is encapsulation through this kind of weird trick. <laughs> But what about implementation mixins needing to find other implementation mixins? Because remember, they're all just going into some tuple, right? If they're different members of a tuple, how do they know about other members in their tuple? The trick here is that every interaction, every, every time any of these need to mutate any state or run any functions or whatever, the call actually comes through the public interface. And in the public interface, I can access this, this magic access base class, right? So if I want the implementation mixins to be able to call these functions and find each other, then I can just capture a pointer to this access base class and pass it in, right? So in this case, M is the mixin, right, being passed in. And A is just you know, our pointer to base with some meta information around it, 
right? So within, so, so we're passing that to the, the member function in the mixin, and the mixin can then use that to find other mixins. And then it can just keep passing it along as long as anybody needs to find any other mixins in the composition. So we've got a system that kind of works here. Everybody can find everybody else generically based on these ability tags. What about initialization? Right? It's, you know, we're unit testing on this idea here. Let's look for the corner cases. And initialization is actually super hard in policy-based class design because you have a bunch of policies that don't really know, and the composition doesn't really know anything about your policies and their requirements, right? But in our composition, and once we've initialized the tuple, then we can run some sort of two-phase initialization-y kind of thing on everybody that actually requires some special initialization, right? So if you give yourself the ability requires init and destruct, upon initialization, somebody's going to call you and say, here's access to all the other mixins. I mean, maybe you need to allocate something into some buffer upon initialization, right? So this works pretty well in, in theory. Let's test it sort of in practice. And there was a proposal, or there's been many proposals in the SG14 working group um, that have been targeted at sort of different uh, embedded domains. One of them was fixed vector. And the idea is a standard array has a fixed size and a fixed capacity. A vector has a dynamic size and a dynamic capacity. What if I want a fixed capacity and a dynamic size, right? You know, CAN bus messages are, are a good example of this. You know, I have zero to eight data bytes in my CAN frame, right? I can't use an array of eight because sometimes it's smaller. And if I use a vector, well, that's at least three pointers that I'm wasting, right? <laughs> three pointers is ironically larger than the entire data payload. <laughs> Problem was that there's a lot of different options here. Right? I mean, fixed vector, OK. What does it do when it grows past its internal buffer size? Maybe it allocates. Maybe it throws. Maybe it just terminates the world. Maybe it's undefined behavior. What should its public interface look like? Should it have an at member function, which throws on out of bounds? You know, people in some domains, yeah, of course. Should be just the same interface as vector. People that can't use interrupts, uh, can't use exceptions, I don't want that, <laughs> right? So this would be a good candidate for some kind of mix-in, right? You put whatever you want in the public interface, you put whatever you want in the implementation, you got your vector, right? Problem is, the contiguous control block, as in, you know, vector control block-ish kind of a thing, I probably should know how big the buffer is. I mean, it could know how big the buffer is, if it did, it wouldn't have to have a pointer at the end or a pointer at the begin. Just need a pointer to data, right? Or sorry, pointer to end rather than pointer to capacity. Um, in some designs, though, you might want the, the fixed size buffer to actually be outside of the mixin, right? So that you could swap them without invalidating iterators. In that case, the control block would need all three pointers. So the, so the layout of the control block, like the local variables of the control block, are dependent on the buffer, right? The type of buffer, maybe the size of buffer. And the other way around, the buffer's alignment is dependent on whatever type you're allocating into it, which is probably known in the control block, right? So their, their data layout are dependent on each other if we want to optimize this properly. And data and layout needs to be known super early, right? It's, uh, you know, all these member functions in the public interface, well, I can rely on point of instantiation being later and everything being known, and I can figure out everything, but the data layout, point of instantiation of that is 
immediate, right? So this is kind of breaking down, which most things do once you bring them sort of into reality. Difference between a boost library and a standards proposal is indicative of this, right? So I'm getting way behind, ahead of my slides. So the solution for this is to provide a different kind of make mixin. Remember that alias where we associated the abilities with the with the, uh, the mixin type. Let's make a factory, like a meta function that will look at all the other mixins and decide which which uh, concrete instance of this group of, of possible uh, mixins is this thing actually, right? So, so if we're a contiguous control block, we're going to have some factory that will stamp out contiguous control blocks with different pointers and different things fixed, depending on what the buffer is that somebody passed in, right? That means when we're constructing our tuple of all of the uh, all the implementation mixins, we actually have to call all the factories, right? This is the awesomest pack expansion ever. Right, so every one of the factories is getting called with, as a template parameter, all of the other factories or, or implementation mixins. So I can reflect on them before I actually figure out what my type is, right? So we can solve this problem more or less. Another problem is that debug builds are huge. <laughs> this is generally a problem with uh, template metaprogramming. <laughs> there are some solution-ish kinds of things, like uh, um, I believe Jeff Troll has done some work on uh, controlling GDB through a Python script and marking things optimized on a namespace basis with a script. So you can basically say all the stuff in the mixin, just optimize that. And if I step into it, we'll just keep on stepping until I get back to my code, because I don't want to see that optimized stuff, right? With the, with the, uh, the vector example, when do we invalidate iterators, right? I mean. Does swap invalidate iterators? Does move invalidate iterators? Well, that's going to depend on where the data buffer is, right? It can depend on a bunch of things. Do I invalidate iterators on grow? Can I even grow, <laughs> right? So these contracts are actually hard to express as soon as they are dependent on endless compositional possibilities. Well, not quite endless, but close, right? And now we have that same problem with testing, right? If I can mix things together in a very, very large number of combinations, then I have a large number of stuff to test. And we already kind of have this problem in the standard library, because I can mix you know, essentially any, uh, any algorithm with any container, maybe my own container. Right? And we solve this through very, very uh, well-defined interfaces, right? The iterator interface is pretty well-defined. We have different categories, what they require. We'd have more of that in mixins, but that might be solvable. Then we get to constructors, right? I and mean, why can't I just make an alias to this type and then have it just have the same constructor as a normal vector? I mean, passing arguments into a constructor of a composition and then sorting them out to whatever implementation mixins they should go to is actually a pretty hard problem. <laughs> it's also a problem we already have in the standard library to a certain extent. I mean, if you look at the number of constructors on a lot of the, uh, like, tuple has 30 something, right? And they're basically all just, you know, a brute force instantiation of, you know, several different compositional things, right? I mean, either I have a vector or I don't have a vector. OK, that doubles my amount of allocators. <laughs> either I have iterators or I have a range. <laughs> or nothing, <laughs> right? Um, 
it would probably be less error prone and easier to standardize and terser to express the algorithm behind which I'm brute force instantiating all the combinational possibilities of, say, a variance constructor, right? This is uh, kind of ties back into Sean Parent's property models, if you will, right? I have some set of things. Is there a graph with which I can mutate these set of things to the set of things that I can consume? Right? I think his example was, if I need a width and a height, why can't I just take a width and an aspect ratio, or a height and an aspect ratio, or four points, right? I, uh, I've attempted to pass this off to someone who's smarter than me. I, I volunteered Gasper, without his knowledge, to do a talk at C++ Now about how to do this, and he didn't. But he told me I should, uh, I should look at uh, Prolog, because they have a solver for these kinds of constraints. And I think that could be done in template metaprogramming. So maybe this is solvable. I certainly haven't yet. But if it has these sort of unsolvable problems, is it really good for anything? Well, there are some problems that I think it, it could solve. And this is also sort of a domain that I work in. Uh, you know, somewhat safety critical industrial systems. Right? This is there's a big box with a red button and a bunch of possible reasons to push that red button. Right? The idea is that somebody sits there and pushes the red button when the red button needs to be pushed. So if, 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 if the reasons to push the red button are maybe on that screen, then you have some kind of requirement of how long you're going to tolerate between something bad happening and it showing up on that screen. Right? You have some hard real-time requirement. I mean, you also have a hard real-time requirement on the guy needing to push the red button not being asleep. That might be harder to fulfill. But this is a relatively misunderstood problem because it's not necessarily about speed. It's about determinism, right? I mean, if it takes a minute after something overheats before we see it there, that might still be okay. But proving that it won't take more than a day, I mean, maybe it takes average of 300 milliseconds. Will it ever take more than a day? Don't know. That's the problem, right? There's a lot of moving parts behind that thing. And you might think I'm joking, but years ago for, for a user group, I was doing a talk on caching effects, and I did an experiment where I constructed a whole bunch of very, very small objects on the heap, and then deleted them in order, as opposed to shuffling them and then deleting them. Right? The idea was, if I shuffle them, then the cache effects kick in, and it takes a lot longer. But I also, just for shits and giggles, divided this shuffled array up into six different parts and deleted them on six different threads. Right? So deleting them all in one thread took, you know, some small number of milliseconds. How long do you think it took to delete them on six different threads? Because I had exactly six real cores. And so obviously they're all fighting over the heap lock because they can't really delete in parallel, right? These are all allocated from the same heap. So there must be some kind of a lock around it. And there's also probably false sharing going on because they're small enough to maybe now and then share a cache line. So they're fighting over cache lines and heap locks. I took 14 hours. <laughs> and I mean, to their defense, this was you know, a couple years ago. I tried this uh, relatively recently, and it only took like half an hour. But still, half an hour is a lot less than milliseconds. right? So, so we don't know. And there could be really weird scenarios in which the latency on these things become huge. right? And if you think about you know, deleting large linked lists of things, that sounds a little bit like a QT GUI, right? You dump some GUI object, and then suddenly you're throwing away all these widgets. So they make, I mean, they, they usually don't use sort of your classic 
uh, uh, GUI layout, they make their own that are deterministic. A lot of man hours go into this. And they're not that sexy in the end either. <laughs> so could we use mix-ins for GUIs, right? I mean, I say QT, I know it's supposed to be pronounced cute, but I don't like pronouncing it cute because small things are cute, right? If I have this little fluffy bunny, that's, that's cute, right? And this bunny is like the size of Manhattan because it uses virtual functions and the optimizer doesn't understand my bunny, that's not cute anymore, right? <laughs> So if you haven't used sort of the Qt widget system, they also have this QML thing which works differently, but this is just sort of the, the widget system. We have layout widgets. You know, this is a virtual box layout probably where I have this pane down here and this pane up there. And then the panes are then divided in, you know, maybe there's a grid layout up there with four panes and it's one down here. Maybe I have a stretch and then a button and then a button in a, in a horizontal box layout. Maybe that pane up there on the right is divided by another horizontal box layout. And then, you know, this, this uh, font style and bold italic up there, that's probably one widget, which in its implementation is actually two widgets, right? You know, the, the text box and the, and the label. So if, if, uh, if some repaint event comes into the system, then it will be passed to the base, you know, our, 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 uh, our dialog box, which will pass it along to its layout, which will pass it along to its children, which will pass it along to their children, and so on and so on and so forth. And they will all get this event sort of propagated from the root of the tree of widgets all the way to the leaves, right? And this is how repaint of it, uh, paint events work. Key press events work differently because if you were to propagate that event through all of your widgets, using virtual function calls for every time you pushed a button, then that would be painfully slow, right? If the optimizer could reason about this, you could see, hey, there's only two widgets in your entire system that care about key press events right now, right? And it could route it directly to them, and it wouldn't be slow, but it can't because it has to look through all these virtual functions. Right? So could we make a dialog box out of a composition of widgets? Well, if we had sort of a dialog factory function that took a layout factory function, and that layout factory function took more widgets or layouts or whatever, we could actually express this in, in a way that doesn't need virtual functions on the public interface, right? You know, if you're I left out a bunch in the middle there, but if you look at the horizontal box layout, well, that's the very bottom pane, then I got my stretch, which takes up as much space as it can, and then I got up my OK button and my cancel button, right? Could we implement this in terms of mix-ins? Well, if we take just sort of this function as a, as a representative for all of these different factories, and implement it in terms of a compose, right? So I'm a function that takes a very adamant amount of children, right? Then I'm gonna prepend some abilities because I, as a widget, are going to, uh, may be in a composition of widgets, right? So this, this whole composition here could be an implementation widget and a composition up the hierarchy. So I need to give myself abilities, give myself an interface, give myself some forwarding event uh, sorry, some forwarding implementation widget that'll just propagate all the events to the children. Maybe some, you know, that square line that goes around the whole thing and whatnot, right? And then adding to that, I just pour in all, the, uh, all of the widgets that somebody passed in as more implementation makes sense. And so every composition of mixins can itself be a mixin in a higher order composition and I can just nest them. Getting ahead of my slides again here. So this whole thing could just be tree, because what do we not know at compile time in this case, right? We know all of it at compile time. So all of these functions 
could just be direct static calls inlined away if they're not being used. And so we could theoretically make key presses go the same way as all the other events and get rid of all the indirect calls and get rid of the allocation. This could go on the stack, right? It's just one big tuple and then each of its elements is another composition that has another tuple and it's all, you know, data laid out very stack based, right? So this wouldn't quite work for every uh, composition. Sometimes you have a button that might be there or might not, but you could model that as a variant of different buttons or an optional button, right? Then you'd have in that mix in dispatch, you would have, hey, is this thing enabled? If yes, I'll give it an event. If not, I won't, right? And that's, you know, one decision that's going to have to be made when propagating the events rather than just call all the ritual functions and it'll work out, right? So debug builds will be big, but release builds will be considerably smaller than our Manhattan buddy, right? As far as event dispatch, we could actually play a little game here, because we'd say, OK, if somebody dispatches me an event, that first function, well, then I will redispatch that event to all of my children. Anyone who has the ability widget event subscribe, right? I'm the publisher. They're all the subscribers. But I don't just pass the event on. I also pass my access, right? That means I'm passing them this magic token with which they can call functions on my composition of implementation widgets. Right? And so if they're not the top level function, right, then they will get this second function called, which has the root of the tree and the event. Right? Because we may want that text box up there to update what's selected in the selecty box when I type something in. And the other way around, if I select something else in the selecty box, then I want the text to change up there. And this is implemented in, in, in Qt in sort of signals and slots, which are, again, a bunch of virtual function calls. Right? But if we wanted to implement this sort of directly, we could name our, our signal and our slot and then just dispatch an event to the root because we have its, its little access token from anywhere in the tree, right? So if, uh, if this guy got a key press event, said, hey, there's somebody else that wants to know about that whenever my text changes, then it can dispatch to the root an event of, I don't know, dialog box XY, or sorry, text box XYZ changed. And somebody might be subscribing to that, maybe this guy. Maybe his text changed, and now he has to update some slider, I don't know. You can just keep ping-ponging these things around, and they're all, they're all static function calls, right? They're all, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's no indirect function calls going on here. So at this point in the talk, it's probably becoming apparent why I put so much work into making very, very large metaprograms compile relatively fast, right? I mean, as soon as you have a lot faster TMP, you get a lot more modeling power, and you can build much larger things, right? I mean, I, you know, I built a tree with 100 widgets in it, and uh, debug build's pretty big, but release is tiny, and it compiles in like a minute on my machine, which, I mean, that's actually not that much slower than Qt compiles. But coming back to sort of what I designed this for, this is step seven of a 17-step Hello World tutorial for a microcontroller. This is actually from the microcontroller manufacturer, so it's not just some guy that's trying to win an obfuscation contest, although it may look like it. And the root problem here is that C is not generic. And this is C trying to be generic, right? And the problem here is that almost all of these are defaults, right? And they're passing in data structures in order to set 
configurations that are actually known at compile time, right? I mean, a data structure is the vehicle with which you pass around information is not very good because the data structure is the thing that the optimizer can optimize the least, right? So not only is this hard to write and sort of error prone and brittle, it's also not that efficient. And if we were to say, okay, let's just take the relevant information, right? The inherent complexity, not all of this artificial complexity. Because, I mean, there's 16 other pages of this, right? Dumb it down to the stuff that's not a default, right? I've been, I've been wanting this interface for a while. And like I said, I failed at making these things work in policy-based class design. But this is something that we could implement in terms of mix-ins, right? And when we dumb it down to, or sorry, simplify it to uh, just the inherent complexity, we suddenly see, oh, look, that's a blocking right, right? Did you notice that here? The author didn't notice it. There's actually a starvation problem in this hello world. So, We'd need to make like a U-defined literal of port zero, pin nine, and all that stuff, and those would need to be some kind of mix-ins. You know, the, the uh, public interface, obviously interface mix-in, the rest of them, obviously implementation mix-ins. You know, if you were implementing UART1, then you'd look, hey, do I have a baud rate mix-in somewhere in this composition? If yes, well then use that. If not, okay, here's the fallback. Looks something like this, right? We can actually abstract these things in a way that relatively sort of, uh, uh, you know, you'd have to be a good programmer to understand the concept of decomposing things into pieces and composing them back together, but you don't have to understand a whole lot of TMP to write this, right, from a user perspective. All of the TMP is wrapped in the implementation of this customization object. Right? There are a few other things to note here. You know, the pins, the baud rate, that's just compile time known information. They're, they're, you know, those implementation mixins don't have state. So those are going to actually take up room in a tuple. So I'm not actually using a tuple under the hood. Right? But it's tuple like enough that the tuple analogy works well in this talk. The other problem is, you know, maybe not in the microcontroller field, but in other fields, if you start using these big compositions, then they start to have inexpressible types, right? And if you're using them sort of in a function or as a global or something, then you can just use auto, right? But if you want to make them a member of something else, maybe pass them around, maybe have multiple of them be able to use the same interface, it would be nice to be able to sort of generically type erase them because I know they're public interface, right? I mean, I would have to annotate the public interface some in older versions of C++. In newer versions of C++, I could maybe figure it out but there's already sort of a compositional type erasure library called Liberace. It's actually uh, some of the inspiration for the implementation of this talk. I actually implemented it differently before I saw this library. And so we could just make a public interface with interface mixins, and this type erased wrapper would then work with any mixin that had at least that many interface makes sense, right? Need at least a foo and a bar. If we have more, that's okay. That's just not accessible through the type erased public interface. So kind of in conclusion, I mean, there's, there's, uh, um, I get a lot of questions about sort of the standardization of mixins. And I know there's been, I think, three proposals so far that have all failed. Um, and I didn't know that when I set out to do this. <laughs> um, I was just sort of solving my problem, which happened to be, because it's generic programming, 
useful, usable in solving a lot of other problems. Um, I think if we're going to try and standardize it, there are still certainly some, uh, some unsolved problems here. Right? Uh, the, the interface that you could use to talk between the mixins could get a lot better with the new metaprogramming features that we have. Right? If you look at C++ 23, kind of, I mean, this is definitely too late to go into 20. Um, if you look sort of in that horizon, we'll have probably some kind of reflection generation stuff. So you could actually make the glue code work without the user putting a whole lot of effort into it. Um, but you still have the problem of the constructor, right? If I want to make this composition type, I just have the type and I want to construct it and I want all the data to go in to the right places, then how do you do that, right? Like you, you still need to solve that problem. And we actually have the same sort of a problem in a lot of other libraries. If you look at like Boost Graph, the public interface to Boost Graph is not so great and has kind of this problem of I need to be able to call some function with sort of any set of things that could be converted into the input of this function. And if you look at the size of a lot of overload sets in a lot of libraries, that's just adding artificial complexity, right? You know, if, I, if I take, for the sake of argument, anything that is convertible to this set of SI units, then I should be able to programmatically express that if you have units that are convertible in some way, maybe as a group, as long as there's some graph between what you provided and what I consume, then we should have some functionality, some infrastructure for that. Right? And so if I didn't have kids, that'd be what I'd be working on right now. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. I'm gonna open up for questions. Thanks for the talk. Uh, Thanks. Very applicable to my field as well. So. Uh, Yay! <laughs> um, just my gut feeling currently is that this also opens some uh, opportunities of, of code that um, fails to compile, and it's not <laughs> very clear at first where exactly you, the error comes from. So I was thinking, is this something you would solve by using concepts? Does this have a place in what you're talking about? Or what is your idea of this? Yeah, um, I kind of anticipated this question. Um, there are kinds of errors where we can actually give you a very good error message, right? Like if you said, you know, execute mix in with this ability then you have a requirement that there's one of those in the composition. If there's not, I can give you a text, you know, you asked for this, doesn't exist, that's not a valid composition, right? Um, I'm not sure that concepts actually help me much there, because a concept, at least current concepts, light or whatever they're calling it now, <laughs> um, is mostly just a, an expression of the syntactic requirements on a type. At least that's the only thing that's really enforced, right? If I have a concept of an iterator, forward iterator, well, that thing needs plus plus and dereference. It doesn't really matter what they do. It'll still, like the compiler won't, won't catch that I've said, oh, plus plus, that actually files the missiles, right? Um, and that's kind of the best you can do with sort of the way concepts work now, right? Uh, you can only look at the syntax of the public interface. You can't really look at the implementation. And I, you know, there's, there was a previous, at some point in history of the many flavors of concepts, there was uh, 
more of an opt-in style of concepts, right? Which is relatively sim similar to this. I mean, I, I say, okay, this type has this ability. That's the syntactic requirement, but also a semantic requirement, right? If I say this is an allocator, it not only has to have a function named allocate, it also has to do a bunch of stuff in that function, right? Then there's, <laughs> I mean, if you, in your public interface mix in, take a type and don't derive from it, well, that's gonna be an ugly error, <laughs> right? Um, there are a few things where, you know, the compiler is just gonna dump its stack of instantiations. And I mean, that is usually long and ugly and whatnot, but in general, I mean, if you look at a lot of Python errors, they're also just, hey, here's the call stack. I don't know what went wrong. Right? And that's basically what the compiler is doing there. So yeah, I'm not really sure how to fix that. I mean, if I had reflection, I could kind of reflect on this type and say, hey, are you deriving from that? On the other hand, if I had reflection, I could just do it differently anyway. So I think uh, you know, of the upcoming features, uh, Andre was right. <laughs> reflection and code gen, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. This uh, goes way back to the beginning where you're talking about um, uh, basically creating some sort of a layer on top of the hardware that you have to work. From what I understand, you could be working with various um, uh, hardware components. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they have their various uh, uh, interfaces into their components. They could have their various names. So you could have something that you have to deal with, let's say, for Ring. It could be called Ring in one context, and from another vendor, it may be called Ding. Yeah. Um, and so somehow, when you're creating these mixins, you have to be able to map. And you say, I want to assign the ability of a Ring to a thing called Ding, or that's calling itself Ding. How is that part of it happening? That, sadly, is going to be uh, library authors, right? Uh, there is some, I mean, it, yeah, I understand the problem. Uh, you know, another problem would be uh, um, uh, pin multiplexing, right? Look, I'm, you know, saying, hey, you are, you're this pin. Um, that actually is, you know, centering or clearing some bit in some register in the chip. And although a lot of stuff on microcontrollers, at least ones that come from, or are licensed from ARM, um, they have machine-readable data sheets called CMSYS SVD files. Um, they do describe a lot about the hardware and sort of a, and they're full of bugs because nobody actually uses them, but uh, um, <clears throat> they're also lacking some semantics, right? I mean, I would like a concept of a pin so that I could say, hey, you know, that bit pattern there, that means this pin, which is the same pin as this GPIO, if you were to use it as GPIO, right? And this general problem, yeah, you do find in a lot of different systems where you know you have stuff from different manufacturers and and uh, you have um, you know essentially the same thing but under a different interface or different names, right? And I would still argue that you know creating one sort of adopter mixin for each of these is still easier than writing your library that many times. Right. So you, I mean, the, 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 the advantage you have in this paradigm is you only have to swap out a very small piece depending on the hardware, right? Um, on the other hand, if you have different hardware that has different capabilities, you don't have to dumb it down to the lowest common denominator, right? I mean, with this UART, some of them support automatic baud rate detection. Some of them don't, right? So. All of the generic, we support a bunch of chips libraries, don't really offer that. But here, you could throw it in, and if that UART that's coming from some code generator based on the data sheet knows, hey, that's not supported, well, then we'll get an error, then you didn't have a automatic baud rate detection mix in in your composition, right? The big advantage, at least if you're comparing it to the efficiency of C is, there's going to be an interrupt service routine that's going to be called whenever anything happens, right? You know, maybe I got a uh, byte over the wire, or maybe I detected a baud rate, or maybe, you know, whatever. My input buffer's still empty and it's reminding me, or, or sorry, my output buffer. Um, and so there's a bunch of different 
sort of trees in this call when, when this interrupt service routine happens, and I check bits, oh, you know, which status flag is it, which, what, what caused this? And the optimizer has no idea that this status flag over here can only be set if you actually turn this thing on in this completely different memory address, right? But we do. So if you didn't put an automatic baud rate detection mix in here so that you can initiate the process of de detecting the baud rate, then we can eliminate that entire branch in the interrupt service routine handler because we know. And that's pretty impossible to do in C, right? So if you have sort of a typical use case of a driver that supports a lot of stuff, you're paying for all that stuff in C, but you're not in C++ because we have you know, the ability to express ourselves generically. Yeah. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Yeah.